Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you very much for that nice welcome. It's very nice to be here, very exciting for me to do it for the first time. So I can start by saying I'm feeling very optimistic about this evening, at least, and I wonder who else in the audience is feeling cheerful, excited, and sometimes, don't they, feelings of elation and trepidation sometimes aren't that far from feelings of being frightened, a bit trepidatious. In a funny way, the human feelings that all encourage adrenaline to course around our veins can come from negative and positive readings of exactly the same situation. And of course, different individuals look at exactly the same situation, 2016, in very different ways. Last year, the beginning of this year, for some people might look like a liberation, for others it might look like a complete disaster that threatens the very fabric of the countries in the West that we've all lived in. Um, in recent years. And I think one of the things about tonight's debate is the way that politics and human psychology and thought all smash up against each other and we all respond to similar situations in such different ways. And we have three excellent panelists with us tonight to explore these issues. On my far right, Matt Ridley, who will be familiar to many of you as one of the UK's most popular science writers, of course, regular columnist in The Times whose books have sold over a million copies, which is not too shabby, but he will be signing books in the foyer, along with the other two, at the end of the debate. <laughs> well, maybe by the end of tonight, you will have done. Um, he writes regularly also in the Wall Street Journal, and his most recent book is The Evolution of Everything. Johan Norberg, on my right, is a Swedish author and filmmaker. He has a weekly column in Sweden's biggest daily, Metro, which I'm sure some of our audience, at least, will be familiar with. And he's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, and his latest book is Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. So, smiles from both of you. Here are the optimists. <laughs> <laughs> on my left, hopefully not feeling too lonely, is uh, like Professor- the audience are on my side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. We will see, and I'm a bit worried about that. <laughs> is um, Professor David Runciman, Professor of Politics at Cambridge, who writes regularly about politics for The Guardian and also the London Review of Books. And his books include The Confidence Trap, A History of Democracy in Crisis from World War I to the Present, written before what's just happened in America. So, tonight's format. Um, in just a moment, I will be inviting our speakers to give us some opening thoughts, a few appetizers before we get on to the full meat and drink. But before we do that, I want to say loud and proud that you're also going to have to do some of the work. At about 10 to 8, we'll be opening up to the floor for your questions to prompt further discussion and try to extract more from these guys here. So please, as we proceed, be thinking about the kinds of issues that you want to raise. But before we even get to that, just for fun, straw poll, if you're brave enough to stick your hand up, who is feeling optimistic about the world right now. I thought you were putting your hand up for no, a second. I'm I think that's cheating. <laughs> I'm trying uh, to see. Okay, that uh, looks kind of oh, maybe 40%. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I'm taking an impartial BBC position, of course. Um, who's feeling pessimistic? Because there might be some people who are not taking a view, abstaining. Okay, so a lot of abstentions. Wow, okay. And for fun, we're going to repeat that at the end of the night. Okay. So I think that was maybe, I don't know, 50-50, but with some abstentions. Okay. So let's start with the cheery news. Let's always start with the, the good news. Um, Matt, why should we be optimistic about the world as we see it in front of us now? There was a poll the other day, an opinion poll of a large number of people, and they were asked, uh, of these three propositions, which one is correct? That global poverty over the last uh, 20 years has doubled, has halved, or has stayed the same? And uh, about 5% thought it had halved, and about 60% thought it had doubled. And that's wrong, because it's halved. It's really wrong. But it's more than wrong, as you say. Because if you'd written those three answers on three different bananas, 
and thrown them into a cage full of chimpanzees and measured which one picked them up first. The chimpanzees would have got it right 33% of the time instead of 5% of the time. So the point is not that we're ignorant of what's going on in the world. We're, a we're, we're actively, we know things that are wrong. And why is that? It's because of your industry and my industry, Laura, because we only tell the bad news. When an aeroplane uh, doesn't crash, we don't report it. Uh, so there, is, there tends to be a uh, tendency to only hear about the things that are going wrong in the world. And as a result, we tend to um, uh, drown ourselves in pessimism. And secretly, quietly, without us watching, the world has been getting better in all sorts of extraordinary ways. For me, this, my, my optimism isn't based on personality or character. I'm, I can be as gloomy as anyone, particularly at three in the morning. But it, it, it's based on the data. Because um, when I was growing up, I believed the pessimists, and I never heard the optimists. You know, when I was a student, uh, the population explosion was unstoppable, famine was inevitable, pesticides were going to shorten our lives, acid rain was going to destroy uh, forests in the north, rainforests were going to disappear, the desert was advancing, the ozone layer was collapsing, uh, um, you know, uh, nuclear weapons were going to get us, my sperm count was falling. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and at the end of the year 1999, just because the computers couldn't cope with a number, civilization was going to collapse. <laughs> and I just began to notice after a while that these things weren't happening and that extraordinary improvements in, for example, health were happening all around the world. Child mortality down by two-thirds in my lifetime. That's the biggest measure of misery I can think of. Uh, uh, AIDS. Everybody thought it was going to go on getting worse and worse, instead of which it's getting better at the moment. Yeah. Uh, malaria mortality down by 60% in this century alone, in the last 15 years. These are unbelievable achievements, and they're continuing. Johan. Just like Matt, I used to be a pessimist. Uh, just like most people, I think, I thought when I was growing up, that there must have been a better era some, at some point in history, at some point where we didn't have all these problems that we had, a more harmonious era. Um, everybody thinks so. Um, lots of people in the audience probably. One of the first uh, expressions of sort of human civilization, the first written words, were basically there must have been a better civilization at some point where, where things were better. Um, that's what they were telling one another in Mesopotamia. That's what they were telling one another in ancient Greek, Greece, that there must have been a better year at some point, because now it's awful. Um, I thought that all these things about the environment, about uh, world poverty and so on, were, were quite awful, and I thought that there must have been good old days before in the Industrial Revolution. What changed my mind was really studying history and studying Swedish history. I'm, I'm from Sweden, my ancestors in northern Sweden. I studied their history, and I began to think, what, where, where would I have been if life living standards were the same today as they were back then? And I quickly realized that I wouldn't have been anywhere because life expectancy was 30 years. I would have been dead by then. <laughs> they were mixing bark from the trees in the bread to make it go longer so that more children would survive. And that sort of shook my confidence that there must have been a better era at some other point. And then I began to study history, also other parts of the world, and traveling around and looking at that kind of progress that goes on in other places. Uh, but really, history is the one thing that convinced me. One particular country, a place where extreme poverty is 20 percentage point higher than in the average sub-Saharan African country, where life expectancy is almost 20 years shorter and infant mortality is three times bigger. What's that? Well, that's the richest country on the planet, Great Britain, 200 years ago. Now we have to go to the poorest countries in sub-Saharan Africa to see the kind of misery that the richest people on the planet lived in 200 years ago. And that convinced me that something has been going right all through human civilization, and that continues all the time. I used to say at these kinds of events that every minute that we talk about these things, one, another 100 people rise out of extreme poverty around the world. That's now outdated. Now it's around 200 people. But it never makes the news because it's that kind of slow, steady progress that doesn't shock you. It's not like a plane crashing or anything like that. So I, I'm also terrified when I wake up in the morning and read the news. That's why I go to 
history and to data and to statistics. And that makes me an optimist. Okay, David. Sorry. <laughs> Over um, to you, because it's rather too much of blaming my profession for. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I, mean, I, I, I think it's not just, <laughs> you can't just blame the journalists. <laughs> Um, I wouldn't dispute for a minute if you if you asked anyone in this room to do that lottery of life thing, that what's kind of in my profession known as this kind of Rawlsian experiment, where you don't know anything about who you are, what kind of person you are, you just know the basic social facts, and you ask someone when would you like to have been born, the correct answer is now. I mean that's absolutely unequivocal. Um, the present is better than the past, and also I wouldn't dispute for a minute that in some parts of the world progress in the last 20 to 30 years has been mind blowing on a scale we've never seen in history. So the, the British story might be 200 years, but some countries are sort of squeezing this into 20, 30 years. It's, a, it's extraordinary. But what doesn't follow for me from that is that our future is necessarily going to be better than our present. And I think to be an optimist, you do have to believe that. So, I mean, I, I need to hear from you, not why. It's easy to be optimistic about the present being better than the past, because that's not optimism. As you say, that's the fact. Um, and I think if you do the thought experiment which is, would you rather be alive now or in 50 years' time? I don't think it's irrational. I th I, I'm pretty sure if you lived in sub-Saharan Africa or in China or in India or many parts of Asia, you would take that bet, particularly if you didn't know where you were in a, the social... Maybe if you were at the top of those societies, you might not, but for most people, it makes sense. But for us, I mean, we could ask the audience again, I'm not at all convinced that we would take our chances on 50 years from now for a range of reasons, we can get into them. I'll just briefly sort of recap a few of them. This is not a steady story of progress. I mean, there are reverses. And we've had a great 50 years, and the world's had a great 30 years. And in historical terms, that is a very short period of time. And you know, history tells other lessons, too. You can tell the story of human progress in many different ways. It's not steady. It's not regular. It, it jags a lot just because we haven't had a big reversal in our lifetime, I mean, we are the luckiest people ever, does not mean it's not coming. Our societies may be fragile in ways we don't know about. Um, that's got to be at least possible. Um, the fact that some parts of the world have got this accelerated growth, this really condensed, accelerated burst of wealth and health, in that broad historical suite, you could look at the story of human progress and say, actually, it's not some nice upward slope. It's millennia of bumping along at the bottom, and then an explosion. And the explosion is maybe for us 100, 150 years, for some societies 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. These could be unique periods in history. They could be entirely sui generis. They could have features that we barely understand, and to see it as a sort of historical sweep could be to mistake them. And we do not know how they end. I mean, we don't know the next thing. And is the next thing better than this? We're on the cusp of a technological revolution that I think makes the future really unknowable, and one of the reasons I'm not sure I want to take that 50-year gamble is it might be great, it might be awful, and it might be unrecognizable, and I'm, I would be anxious about that. And can I just say one more thing, which is it comes out of reading Johann's book, which is even in that historical story, there's a lot of complaining at the end, as Matt said, about human beings being stupid and ignorant <laughs> and not understanding. You, know, you, you say it, that you, you ask people, <coughs> And they have no idea how much better the world has got, and then they blame the journalists. Um, <laughs> but this story of progress has happened in societies full of those kinds of people. I mean, you know, it is pessimistic societies yeah. that have produced the progress that you want. And I would not also be particularly optimistic about a future in a society full of optimists. We don't know what that looks like. <laughs> we don't know what that looks like, and... Um, <laughs> No, I think maybe the optimism, it, it, you, if you want progress, it needs to be leavened with a lot of caution. Just briefly, before we come back to the other two, what is it, though, that makes you see the unknowable mm. as something that is more likely to be negative than positive? Um, so, I, so on lots of things, I don't think it's more likely. So, so you know, there are lots of different ways of telling this story. So just take the 20th century in violence. We'll probably come on to violence and war. Um, it's very, very unlikely. So we don't come on to violence yeah. amongst the panel yeah, we'll and talk the about audience. It. But, but in, that, you know, in, the, in this story, the Stephen Pinker, Matt, and other things, you've both told this story. Um, in the 20th century, at the end of the century, war was so much less likely in so many parts of the world than it was at the beginning, and you know, war on the European continent seems to me incredibly remote and so on. But it's a kind of, I don't really like this phrase, but it's kind of a long-tail story 
in that the middle has been completely squeezed out, that sort of long story of human history where people used to kill each other in their thousands and tens of thousands. And in some parts of the world, like Europe, that's just gone. And any violence there is has been pushed right down. But then the 20th century shows you that then what you also do get when it goes wrong is cataclysmic. And so I don't actually think that, you know, I think the chances of war on the continent of Europe are very, very remote. But if something does go wrong with this fragile but very successful world we've created, I think it will go badly wrong. The, we live in a world where there is massive destructive capacity. The fact none of it has been used doesn't mean we should be confident about the fact that were it to be used, it wouldn't be catastrophic. I mean, Matt, doesn't David have a point in that by the two of you have both from your opening remarks come to the conclusion of being optimistic based on where we are now mm. compared to the past? What yes. is it that gives you both the confidence about the future other than, okay, that's what experience should tell us? David's quite right that we shouldn't be naive extrapolationists. Just because things have been good in the past doesn't mean they're going to be good in the future. If you try that in a, in a uh, casino, you'll find it doesn't work very well. Um, uh, it's personal experience of that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay, the historian, Lord Macaulay, uh, wrote in 1830 uh, a review of Robert Southey's very gloomy book about this industrialization thing that was going to end in tears. And, and he said... Uh, on what principle is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we should expect nothing but deterioration before us? And he wrote that when living standards were incredibly low. And he was already fed up with the pessimists saying it can't get better, it, it can only get worse. But David's right that just because it's got better in the past doesn't mean it's going to get better in the future. And that's why my optimism is, is partly based on that, but partly on why it's getting better. What is it that's driven uh, the improvements in human living standards? And the answer, in a word, is innovation. Not just innovation in technology, but innovation in uh, the way we behave and uh, the way we organize society and so on. And that there is no reason to think that that innovation is either slowing down or running out of fuel because we know that innovation is basically the combination and recombination of ideas. And there is no, you know, the number of ideas on the planet is infinite. You know, there is no, I, 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 we're not going to run out of that just, we'll run out of oil before we run out of ideas, uh, if you like. So, uh, um, and, and, and you see that every day. You see that with someone coming up with an innovation that you think, oh, gosh, yes, that's quite useful. I hadn't thought of that. You know, a new way of combining GPS with toothbrushes to... Um, I don't know what, you know, do you see you what I mean? You lose your toothbrush your on mark. the tube or something. I don't to know. find out where you've left your toothbrush, uh, for example. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and just one point on, on, on the, the, the bumpiness, mm. which David's right, right to, to say. I was writing The Rational Optimist uh, in 2009, which turned out to be the only year since the Second World War when the world economy shrank. <laughs> which was kind of bad luck, actually, if you think about it. It shrank by 0.9% on the first estimate of the IMF. Actually, they upgraded that to a sort of zero at the end of the day, so it didn't really shrink. It grew by 5% the next year. It's back completely on track. If you look at, if you look at the world economy, it does this, and then it, it, get, it overshoots a bit. It, it gets a bit over control, and then it bumps back, and then it comes back on track. It's... it's uh, the the The... the there, is a te there are bubbles and there are crashes, and, and yet, in the end, there's something marching us towards better lo living standards. Isn't there, though, Johan, in, I mean, particularly maybe in, in Western democracies that have seen, as, as, as you've outlined, a kind of 50 years of progress, for want of a better word, there is, though, you pick it up, I'm sure many of the audience feel this, a sort of generational anxiety. Mm. Right now, people, you know, and, and, and we do it in, in my job right around the country, talk to people, they're worried about the jobs that their kids are going to do, the house prices, what's going to happen to the economy. There is a, a, an unease in many Western countries that maybe wasn't there a few generations ago, right? Sure. Well, maybe? I mean, or I, a different one, that generational I mean, tension. I, I can feel that as well. I mean, if you think you're unlucky publishing the book in the year when the world economy shrank. Well, I published my book on progress in the year when David Bowie and Leonard Cohen died and Donald Trump <laughs> became president of the United States. That's bad luck. Um, so there's bumpiness definitely on this uh, ride. And I do think that there's something, um, partly the fact that we, in the parts of the world that are already 
very rich. We haven't seen the same kind of progress that other places have. Um, if you go to China or Vietnam, you see people are incredibly optimistic because if they are three generations around a, a dinner table, they talk to you about the whole story from rags to riches, basically from famine to working in a modern service industry. Um, but here we're a little bit more concerned, and I also think that's a little bit generational, mm -hmm. not just that our sort of childhood musical idols die, uh, but also... Although that is a very traumatic event it, for many it, people. <laughs> it is. I, I, I'm still a bit pessimistic because of this. Um, <laughs> but also because, you know, uh, Otto Herman, the cultural historian who wrote about this, that almost every civilization and almost every generation and almost every civilization that we have evidence from think that the present generation or the next generation is not up to the standards of previous <laughs> generations. And he thinks, and many have had this theory, is that it's partly because we confuse our own personal and sometimes physical deterioration. We confuse that with the world, in a way, because when I ask people if this is not a golden age, when was the golden age? If you look at the data, you notice that people have never lived as long in such good health, with such wealth and freedom as they do today. But if this is not the golden era, when was the golden era? They often happen to point to the era in which they grew up. Because then you're young, and the world hopefully seems exciting, but at the same time pretty safe, because you don't pay the bills. And you, don't, and you don't have kids, so you don't worry about everything that could go wrong. But then you go old, grow older, you get kids, and then you have to think about all the things that could go wrong. You pay more attention to the news and, and other things, and perhaps there's a certain deterioration. Uh, and then you think that something was better previously. As Abe Simpsons in the cartoon The Simpsons put it, um, Grandpa Simpsons, uh, I used to be with it. But then they changed what it was, <laughs> and now whatever I'm with is not it. And whatever is it seems dangerous and scary and confusing to so me. David, so, just psychology. And, and now the baby boom mean, generation yeah. is retiring. So, yeah. of course, we have this explosion of nostalgia. So more people yeah. are gutted about getting older. Yeah. I, so yeah, I, I do think, I mean, I think there's a different way of reading this nostalgia. I mean, in, in a sense, I actually think, given that your story is true about the present being better than the past, that people are nostalgic, not for the past, but for a kind of future, if you know what I mean. That, that is, when they were kids, they knew that the next 50 years, the world was going to get better. And so they're nostalgic for a time when the future was knowable and certain. And now, I don't think it's irrational for them to have doubts about that. I mean, that 50-year story we've been talking about, it's very mm -hmm. condensed. I wouldn't call it history. I mean, it's too recent to be history. It's, it's a recent phenomenon. It's, it's these lives. But the next 50 years is really unknowable. And it may be that it's, mm -hmm. we should take that last 50 years and extrapolate forward from that. But I don't think it's crazy of people to hark back to a time, not because they believe the 50s was better than now, or the 60s was better than now, but the 50s and the 60s preceded now, and that's what they're nostalgic for. And they have that kind of sense that the future, and I think this, I, don't, I mean, I certainly have it, um, <laughs> that it's just kind of this chasm in front of us. Mm. And I think there are reasons to be scared of it. And then the other thing I would say is, and, and I completely agree with you, it's fantastically churlish of people in the West not to celebrate the fantastic progress that's been made in parts of the world we know little or nothing about. And we should celebrate it more, we should know more about it. We should know more about the transformation in people's life chances in Vietnam. But that, that's not a reason for us to be optimistic about our own society. Is it naive, then, to be optimistic, given the amount of political uncertainty in the West? Well, I mean, the, the UK's decision... Uh, no question. There are pockets of Western society in which life has not got much better in the last 30 or 40 years, and a lot of those people in the United States voted for Donald Trump. I mean, it's, it's a mix, because actually a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump, their lives have got a lot better, they're wealthy and so on. But you know, we know that there are parts of, say, a society like America which has really struggled for 30 or 40 years. And certainly the one thing I would think is not good politics is to tell those people, but you should be grateful that it's a lot better than the 1850s, and you should be grateful for what's happening in Vietnam. You should. That's not going to persuade them not to vote for Donald Trump. It's going to make them yes. run into the arms of Donald <laughs> yeah. Trump if you talk to them like that. I, I mean, I, I personally found the American election rather depressing because it was a competition between two pessimisms, and the most pessimistic candidate won, uh, if you like. Um, and... You know, that, that both of them were saying, 
Isn't it awful? Isn't it awful? But one um, was saying, make America great again. He was, yes, exactly. No, no, the, 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 exactly. But, you know, and, and if, if, there's a, if, if there's a quicker way of making sure that the life of a Midwestern blue-collar person gets worse than shutting the economy off from world trade, I don't know it. So, you know, I, I am concerned that he's got the wrong... Diagno wrong, wrong treatment for, for the diagnosis. And by the way, you know, again, if, if, uh, if he's going to um, cut off trade, uh, if he's going to stop importing things from Mexico and build a lot of infrastructure, then an awful lot of Mexicans are going to cross the border to come and help build this infrastructure, which does seem to be something he doesn't want. You know, so there's, the, there, are, there are possible policies there that could prove to, to be self-fulfilling of, of, his, of his pessimism. And that bothers me. You know, I, our Brexit uh, campaign was basically fought on, on two versions of pessimism again. Well, I don't think entirely. I think, I think the Brexit side were trying to paint an optimistic visit, vision to some extent. But, you know, there's no question that on the other side it was an entirely mm -hmm. negative campaign. It, you know, there, there was no attempt to say this is a golden city on the hill, the European Union. Uh, and, and, and I do feel that's wrong. David's right that if I go out there and say... Um, be grateful you're not living in a slum in the 1850s. People are not going to take kindly to that. Um, but, but, but in some sense, it would be nice to find a way of capturing aspirational optimism in politics. And we don't seem to be able to do that at the moment. Why or, do you or, think that? Or ever. Or ever. Well. Uh, well. Um, uh, there are examples, surely. Oh, there are, I but mean, they the are the exception. New Labour message of aspiration that many people found cause yeah. with. Obama, people, many people saw him as being a total optimist. Yes, we can. Change is going to come. In a sense, yeah. that's the opposite that kind of, of, of Matt's story about the economy, which has these mm -hmm. little dips and then gets back on track. That's almost the other way. But you know, people are on yeah. the whole gloomy, and then these optimists pop up, and quite quickly they're dragged back down yeah. to the, the New <laughs> Labour. It didn't last forever. Or well, they did win three long. elections, right? Yeah. I mean, but again, you know. yeah. But the, the optimism had gone by the third one. Do you think that pessimism just appeals to people? I mean, basically, <laughs> pessimists win the arguments because of human nature. Well, I think it does. Um, I, I think that it's partly our genetic programming. We are we're pretty bad at being sort of content with life uh, <laughs> because uh, and it's not our fault. It's, <laughs> it's our ancestors. I, I think that the hunter-gatherers who came back from hunting and sat there by the fire and said, oh, life is good, now let's just relax. Um, they were probably eaten by a predator or something like that or ended up in a vicious storm. Um, whereas there were a couple of them who were worried, looking at the horizon, there might be problems coming, perhaps we should hunt and gather a little bit more just, just in case. Uh, they survived and they passed on their genes to us but also their stress hormones to us. So we're always completely obsessed with anything that could go wrong. Because in our reptilian brains, we think it's a threat to our survival. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, if, if someone walks around in the room right now, that's the person I will be paying attention to. Because my reptilian brain thinks that could be a threat. That's something new, something could happen. Um, if someone tells me that there's a fire here, uh, we will all do something about that straight away. If I tell you that the number of people who die in fires has been halved in the last 15 years, no one will care. That's just statistics. Um, so, yes, we are pessimistic by nature a little bit. But, and, but isn't but, that sensible? Well, it's, it, it doesn't, you can't really argue with human nature. It's, it's there yet. <laughs> Perhaps biotechnology will do something about that. Uh, but I think we will always think that risks, we think it's kind of a threat to our survival. And here's where media comes into the picture. Um, bad news sells, if it bleeds, it leads, we all know that. Um, and when I tell my journalist friends that uh, you, you paint an awful picture of the world, we all think the world is on fire, they tell me that, yeah, but that's what you want to read. We know exactly what you want to read. You tell us that you want good, nice stories about the world. You don't. That's not what you're looking at. Um, and that's true. And that's because we are whining. We're problem solvers. Uh, but therefore, we have to be problem seekers in a way. The, what happens right now, and this is another instance where I think that uh, we've seen an increase in pessimism and fear around the world, is that now we have global media which means that journalists have always tried to find the most dramatic thing 
that happened since you tuned in the last time. But now they can look all over the world. And they can find more horrible things. So though, even though homicides have been halved in the last 20 years or so in Western Europe, there's always a brutal serial murder on the loose somewhere. And then that will top the new cycle everywhere. Isn't it also the case, though, that often the most dramatic thing is also the most important? Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's the yes. most Yes, well, and important. this is a good point that David had. Uh, what would a world look like if we were all optimists? if we're all just happy and content. Well, perhaps we wouldn't solve as many problems if we're just content. And that's why we shouldn't think that the world is just sort of automatically getting better. It's also the fact that we do notice problems that helps us to solve those problems as well. Uh, I mean, there is, you're right, Laura, that the bad things that happen in the world tend to happen suddenly, mm -hmm. and the good things tend to happen gradually. And that's quite an interesting phenomenon, actually, I think, you know, and, and, and explains why, you know, they, they don't get mentioned about. But we also, going back to Johan's point about, about our tendency to, to look on these things, in a funny way, people are not that pessimistic about their own lives. Um, in fact, they're too optimistic. They think they're going to stay married longer than they do, for a start. Uh, they think they're going to earn more than they do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the, the closer it gets to home, the more optimistic people are. The more they, they think about the world, the more pessimistic they are, which is a bit strange. And they seem to have a kind of quota of pessimism that they have to apply to something. So, you know, you hear people say, oh, God, I can only get seven megabytes. <laughs> <laughs> or, damn, when am I going to get a signal? Um, or, you know, we're worried about obesity, and we're right to be. It's a problem, and it's getting worse. Uh, you know, not everything's getting better, and that's one. But it's a darn sight better than being worried about starvation. Uh, but people forget that. They take the good for granted and then worry about the next thing. And perhaps they're right, too. But I would say, in response to that, it's worth remembering that innovation tends to come from optimism, not from pessimism. There's a theory that if you don't worry about the problem, you don't solve it. Actually, the, the evidence doesn't support that, because otherwise, desperate societies would be leading the software revolution. You know, Zimbabwe would be top of the league <laughs> instead of Silicon Valley. Whereas it's pretty clear that, that the people who are driving... Uh, the digital uh, industry are ludicrous optimists, you know, Elon yeah. Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and guys like that. Yeah. And there are no doubt more of them penniless in garages in California than there are of the ones that we eventually hear of. But what do you say to yeah, I mean, these I, guys? I don't think people are just uniformly pessimistic. I think they are optimistic about s some surprising things, but that also has its downside. And so I don't want to bring all of this back to Trump. Let's just, mm. we'll move on. But I mean, there, I think there is a case, and I've, I've, I certainly feel this, that actually by voting for Trump, people in the United States revealed, I mean, there's a sort of top line pessimism, but there's an underlying optimism, which is that the American political system can survive Donald Trump. Yeah. And I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, seriously, I think, yeah, I have actually written this. I think if they believed what Trump said about American society, they wouldn't have voted for him. Because if you believe what he says about American society, you wouldn't put that man in charge. They voted for him because they didn't believe him, because they thought it had a kind of underlying stability, security, these kind of safety valves that would... And I think, I mean, genuinely, as a question to all of us, I don't think history gives us any guide to what a Trump presidency would be like. Yes. And to be optimistic about it, mm -hmm. I mean, it may be fine but it equally could be the end of this 50-year story. But it's and we don't know, but people voted for him because they kind of think that they're insulated from the consequences of their choice. But also, many people voted for him because that's who they want. And there are millions of people who feel hugely optimistic that finally they've got someone they can relate to. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think they feel I mean, optimistic that he will shake up the bits they want shaking up, and that the bits that they don't want shaking up will protect them from him. And that seems to me to be pretty wishful. Isn't there one of the problems with telling people to be optimistic or pessimistic when people are coming from positions of expertise and reputation is that actually there is an arrogance in telling people how they should be feeling about the world. And aren't we actually, I would imagine in this room there are probably not very many people who are feeling optimistic about the Trump win, but there are millions of people in America who will be delighted about him winning the presidency. And as you say, we don't know what it's going to look like. Obviously, working for the BBC, I have no view whatsoever. But, right, I mean, this is what happened. It's democracy. He won, he won the election. And one of, it, it didn't the same happen in this country with the vote 
over Brexit. One of the messages that came back from lots of voters we spoke to around the country actually is they were rather fed up of being told how they should feel about things, whether it was good or bad. I can't help somewhat enjoying the discomfiture of the elites, whether it's yeah. in this country over Brexit or in America mm -hmm. over Trump. You know, there is something quite mm -hmm. enjoyable about seeing mm -hmm. all these, these the, the great punditry that knows mm -hmm. how the world work uh, brought back yeah. to reality a little bit. I agree with David that, that you know, that, that, can't, that, that doesn't turn me into a starry-eyed optimist. Uh, uh, although I'm, I mean, I'm, let me make it quite clear, I'm, as a Brexiteer, I'm much more optimistic about Brexit than I am about Trump. Um, uh, and the reason I voted for Brexit is because I actually think there is a big wide world out there and we could have just, a bright Just to future. interrupt briefly, do you think that they go together? Because a lot of people well, have put them... Have, have have chained them as being part of the I've, same I'm phenomenon. afraid they will go together in, in most people's minds and in history. And I, I think in a way it's a mistake because I think many of the people, I think there's very little protectionism in the Brexit vote. I, mean, I, I think people are not voting uh, Brexit because they want trade barriers. They don't. They want free trade with both Europe and the rest of the world. Whereas in America, there has always been a strong tendency to protectionism, and that's fine. So there are, there are big differences. And another difference is that we've just had a constitutional earthquake with a very normal new person in number 10. Mm. They've had a perfectly normal election yeah. with a personal earthquake <laughs> in the yeah. White House. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What do you make of it looking on yeah. to the UK situation? <laughs> I'd, I, I'd rather not talk about it. Um, this is my Achilles heel, if you will, uh, when it comes to optimism, politics generally, um, and both Brexit and Trump, actually. Uh, Trump, for obvious reasons, if you, if you think it's a controversial point, I'd be happy to expand on why I think that's a problem. Um, but also Brexit, uh, partly because, I mean, I'm... I'm Swedish. We're Swedes. We don't want to be left alone in the European Union without you. It's, it'll be awful. So, uh, Join us on the outside. <laughs> we'll wait and see. We're yeah, a bit Italian. more <laughs> moderate and, and see what happens. Uh, then we might join. I'd say my optimism generally is, um, is not about politics. It's about what I think and what I know that people have done when they're reasonably free to explore strange new ideas, experiment with new science, technology, and business models, and exchange the results, exchange the ideas and trade. I'm not necessarily optimistic that politicians will always give us that freedom. But can you call yourself an optimist if you feel pessimistic about politics, which, is, which ultimately... Okay, lots of people don't like politicians, but yeah. ultimately this is an expression of all of us. Yeah. So can you be a, an optimist if you feel pessimistic, let's, pessimistic about politics? Uh, that's a good point. So let me give you a kind of a brutal um, comparison yeah. that explains why I'm an optimist despite anything that might happen politically almost. Uh, because I think that it's really human nature to connect with others, to exchange ideas and goods and services and create more than tomorrow than we do today. And we do that under almost any circumstances. Um, if you go back to the awful 20th century, politically, almost anything that could go wrong did go wrong in the world. We had great the Great Depression, we had two world wars, we had Nazism, fascism, communism, um, the Iron Curtain, it was awful. And yet, if you look at human living standards, at the end of those awful 100 years, we have never seen as much progress as we did during those years. We increased life expectancy from 30 years to almost 70 years. A chronic undernourishment declined from 50% to almost 10% around the world. Extreme poverty declined from around 80% around the world to soon it's down to 10%. So it seems, and that's no comfort for all those who were killed in those wars, all everybody who were oppressed and all those things, but it seems to say that there's something in human nature that we just continue whatever happens. Yeah, see, I'm not comfortable with that, and that's why I think this sweeping historical perspective doesn't stack up. I think those two things are related. I think the explosion in, in wealth and living standards in the 20th century is connected to those wars. And there's a lot of historical evidence from that period that inequality fell, 
because of the wars. And without the wars, you wouldn't have some of this good news story. Now, it may be that Can the you... overall story is broadly positive, but it's not clear. I mean, it's not at all clear, for instance, that moving into a period of 50 years of peace hasn't had some costs for us because actually some of the things that we think are the most valuable achievements of the 20th century were a consequence of the terrible stuff that went with it. As you write in your book, you know, Europe has been this continent that's been fantastic in innovation because all of these little societies rubbed up against each other and ideas kind of banged off each other. But that's the 30 years war, you know, that's the horrific story of the 19th century, the century of peace in Europe, which was unbelievably bloody and violent. And it's not necessarily the case, if we look 50 years into the future, that these peaceful, stable societies simply carry on on this path. And I do genuinely think that it isn't good enough to say that if you just take politics out of it, we're OK. Yeah. We know what causes the good stuff. It's innovation. And we know what makes things go wrong. It's when politics... You know, if, if the world ends, it will be because we got the politics wrong. It won't be because we got the ethics wrong or we got the law wrong, the politics wrong. And the risks of the politics going wrong... I think they are less than they were in the 20th century, but they have not gone away. And I look at someone like Donald Trump, and I think, yeah, a lot of people are optimistic about that. But seriously, in the way that we know what causes innovation, we also know what causes disaster. And he looks to me like someone who could, in a, in a very interconnected, internationally fragile world, politically, not innovation-wise, not health-wise, but politically, he could cause disaster. And it... It scares me, and I don't think I, it scares me because of my sort of primeval ancestors. I think it scares me because it's yeah. scary. I, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but well, it scares but... me too. Uh, and I think that your 50-year bet is, is very thought-provoking. Do we know that things will be better in 50 years' time? We don't, because it's, it's bumpy. But here's well, the question. Yeah. Would you have taken that bet 50 years ago? I'm not sure in the 1960s. Did we get the politics right back then? A lot of people in the US, I meet, say that that was a golden era. I was young and everything was wonderful. But yes, but JFK was murdered. And so was Bob Kennedy. So was Martin Luther King. There were racial riots all over the country. And there was the threat of instant nuclear annihilation. Right, but there is a so lot of polling lot of evidence that back then people thought the world would be better for their kids, yeah. as in China they do. All the polls in China. Chinese people with children think that their kids will have a better life than they do. Americans don't, but they did in the 1960s. Maybe they're right. But David, I'm older than you, and uh, um, uh, and, and while Trump... Sorry, that wasn't meant to be a boast. It's just a factual statement. I'd rather wish it wasn't true. But there we are. And so the point I was going to make is, if you let me finish, is that... Um, I you made uh, your point. I remember Brezhnev. I think he's a much more scary guy than Trump. You know, I think Mao was a scarier guy than Trump. Oh, yeah, sure. Now, that's because Trump is, to, we hope, a sufficient captive of this excellent con American constitution that will mean that, that as you have said rather eloquently, um, probably means that he won't be able to do quite the harm that we, that the Amer American people certainly think it's, it's safe to, to gamble on him. Um, so I think, yes, he's, he's scary. Yes, he's unpredictable. Uh, but... Uh, we, we've survived worse world leaders with their fingers on buttons. Well, and, and it depends we who may we mean by we here, because there's a difference between the sort of story that goes from Mao to China now, whilst we're talking our 50-year success story and then Trump. I don't think we know that sequence. I don't think we've seen that historical sequence. So I'm not yeah, saying no. it's not going to be Mao, it's not going to be Brezhnev. It's, yeah. But I think it's more unknowable than some of these more reassuring sort of long-term stories suggest. Do you two accept what, you know, what you've been putting forward and what a lot of people, a lot of people have been writing about that what, where we are now at the beginning of 2017, we are in a more unknowable world in the West than we have been for quite some time. Do you accept I, that? I don't think I do because mm. I think the future has always been remarkably hard to predict except in the sense mm. of the sort of general trajectories. Mm. Um, uh, you know, Nobody saw mobile phones coming. Nobody saw social media coming. You know, so I think there's a, the, that kind of thing is still out there to ambush us, but it's always been out there to ambush us. In other words, uh, you know, people are appalling at forecasting the future. Experts in particular, if I could get a bit Michael <laughs> Govish for a second. Um, or even uh, Michael Fish. Uh, or so. even Michael Fish, exactly, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, so I, don't, I think it's a sort of special narcissism 
uh, to say our moment in history is unique in how unpredictable the future is. I don't think that's true. I think it's always been unpredictable. But I think that, and here we go back to human psychology, mm -hmm. we know that we survive those problems. So they will always seem pretty insignificant compared to what we're going through right now. Because oh, now yes. we don't yes. know what will happen. So even Brezhnev and all, all those other awful things that were there in the United States in the 1960s, we know that we got through it. We, but in every single instance, in every point of time, you didn't know that you would. And that's why we always worry more about the present. Isn't there, perhaps though, Matt, in, in this country, maybe it's a uniquely British point, but in the last five, ten years, the erosion of trust that many people believe there has been in our institutions, in our big institutions, whether that's from the expenses scandal or whether it's because of the hacking scandal or whatever, the belief in authority, has that not changed the dynamic somewhat to make the future more but unknowable that, that and therefore you're more pessimistic? Exactly. But you're What's wrong smiling. with that? Yeah. Well, I'm, What's not, wrong with that? I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but in terms of the, unknow the unknowability, you know, to go all Rumsfeld, right? The known unknowns seem to be multiplied because it, it, people's faith in the sort of girders that have strongly held our society in a certain framework. Maybe that's... On the whole, I think it's better if society is getting less paternalistic, we're being told what to do less, we're making up our own minds from, from the bottom. It's probably a bit less comfortable, I agree. And, it, and at times, you know, and you do worry, does this mean the mob, which is what they, you know, in the great reform bill debates, that's what they're worried about. If we let, you know, more than three people have the vote, God knows what might happen. Let alone uh, but, women, my God. Uh, on, the whole, like that. No, no. on the whole, the power of the consumer, the power of ordinary people, the power of, of, <laughs> of social, of, of amateurs in the media, sorry, mm -hmm. you know, social media, etc. On the whole, I like it, but then I'm a bit of an anarchist. <laughs> in a moment, I'm going to come to your questions on the floor, so please start being thinking and being ready. Um, but I just, David, finally want to come to you. Um, in terms of your own view of being pessimistic about what we might face, I, I must just ask, what do you think is the biggest threat? What's the biggest risk? So I, I um, we're living through an innovation explosion. And as you say, the, you know, the, the wild optimism of Silicon Valley um, puts optimists like you to shame. I mean, it's, it's really, <laughs> you know, all problems are solvable and poli politics can be taken out of the equation, you can just bypass politics if you get the right mm -hmm. forms of communication and information sharing, you don't need politics. That kind of wild optimism unnerves me. And I do, so yeah, okay, maybe it's narcissistic, but I do think there is something, there's something unique about every moment in history. I think there is something unique about living in this information explosion age. It's so rapid, mm -hmm. uh, the world is so interconnected um, I think we, we are, because we live in fantastically peaceful, prosperous, well-off societies, we are insulated from many shocks. But I think that insulation possibly blinds us to some of the ways in which it's very interconnected, and if it goes wrong somewhere, it could go wrong somewhere else. And I do believe that the, the next 30, 40 years are unknowable in ways that it wasn't unknowable in the 60s and 70s. And that, that, that if you ask someone in 1950 to imagine the world of 2000, they could guess it, they wouldn't guess the internet and the web, but it would be. And the next 50 years, there could be a step change because of this technology. And it could be great, it could be awful, and it could be in some ways unrecognizable. Um, and just because it's unrecognizable doesn't mean it's bad. Mm. But I think that's not irrational for us to think it's unnerving in ways that it wasn't unnerving for earlier generations. Yeah, and, and if it goes wrong, I think it could go wrong on a scale that we're not, after our last 50 years of fun, not yeah. prepared for. On, on that specific point, I mean, if you'd asked people in 1950 what the world, to, the world of 2000 would look like, they would have said there would have been a huge transport change. We'd, be yeah. all, we'd, be, yeah. we'd all have personal gyrocopters and routine space flights and yeah. all that kind of thing. And that didn't happen. And transport they could predict ran it, into a brick wall. But, the, but, when, if, if but they, they would have missed it, they the might communication it. revolution. You know? yeah. And it, so it could be that the next 50 years is, is not about either transport or communication, but about biotech, for example, or something like that. I think that's absolutely right. Just to answer Laura's question very quickly, what am I worried about? Because I am worried about something. Mm -hmm. Superstition. Too much of it, and it's spreading. Why do you say that briefly? And then I want to go to the floor. I mean, militant um, religion, 
sorry, no, religious militantism, I should say, is probably the best way of putting it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also mean, you know, sort of superstition about environmental threats, etc. I think some of the green stuff is superstitious. So I think we're, there's too much of that. And bureaucracy. The, wor the world, world is essentially a race between innovation and bureaucracy. Innovation usually wins, but it might not. Okay. I must ask you also what you're most worried about because I've asked the other two very briefly because I really want to go to the floor. I'm worried about the fact that we worry so much. I'm, I'm afraid of fear because fear is very dangerous. If we are convinced that the world is falling apart, that changes our mentality. That triggers, as some social psychologists point out, an authoritarian reflex. If we're afraid of the world, then we tend to build walls and try to isolate ourselves from others or begin to arm uh, ourselves. And, and that might really be the thing that ruins our progress because it's so dependent on an open world and the fact that we share information and trade and, and so on. So if people are afraid mm -hmm. of the future, then the few, that might be a self-fulfilling fear. Okay, thank you all three for now. I'd like to go to the floor. So if you have a question, please stick your hand up. Oh. If you are upstairs, there's a standing mic up there at the front of the gallery. So if you're upstairs and you want to ask a question, please come to the microphone. And in order to get some few, I'm going to take a few um, together in a small group. So also, if you don't mind, if you're able to, if you could stand up when you ask your question, because just the, other, the rest of the audience will have a, a better chance at hearing you. So um, lady there, first of all, please, I'm going to take a question from you. And then you two gentlemen sitting next to each other will be our first trio. OK, thank you so much. If we accept that we have never had it so good in the West, how do you explain that we have an unprecedented explosion of mental illness at this point? OK. Uh, gentlemen there. There seems to be a consensus on the panel that um, innovation is a cause for optimism. Um, I accept that, but I also think that um, it's a great cause for pessimism as well. I think, I think it's true that something like 10% of the uh, um, occupations uh, of men in the United States are involved in driving something. In 10, 20 years' time, those jobs are probably almost all gone. We've seen a Japanese insurance company making scores of jobs uh, redundant being replaced by an algorithm. How are we going to face those challenges as a society? And Thank you, Tony Curzon Price from Open Democracy. So I'd like to go back to the violence of the 20th century. One interpretation of the violence of the 20th century is that there were probably 10 agencies that had the power to create destruction on an industrial scale, and two of them, Germany and Russia, actually exercised that power to create mass destruction. So two out of 10. I'm an optimist about technology, and I think that one of the things that's going to happen to technology is there'll be a mass democratization of the power of destruction. Can we really make the world safe? Last time we had the power of mass destruction, two out of the 10 who could do it tried to. When it's going to be millions, can we really make the world safe for the democratization of the technology of destruction? Thank you, Thank you both very much. So three very thought-provoking ones to start it off. Matt, first briefly to you, on the question of mental health, if everything's so fabulous, why are we seeing what are described as record levels of mental health problems? It's a really good question, and it's an exception to my rule. It's something that isn't getting better. Um, part of it is that we're more prepared to uh, recognize it and, and diagnose it. Uh, you know, there was an awful lot of mental health that was simply not recognized before. And when you're starving, you don't have time to worry about whether someone's depressed. So th that's part of it. There's also... You know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's all of it. I do think there are other aspects of, of uh, society that do seem to be making uh, mental illness uh, more of a problem. Like obesity, it's something that, I, that is a challenge we're not yet very good at coping with. Uh, my confidence is that we will get better at coping with it. Some of the mechanisms for understanding mental health are getting better and better. Uh, and uh, there's a, of course, some of it is also because we're getting older. You know, on average, people are reaching ages where they can get Alzheimer's and things like that much more. So, uh, yes, uh, I won't try and pretend that it's not happening, uh, but I will say that I think there's every chance that biologists and psychologists and others can bring to bear mechanisms to improve it. Um, Johan, why should we be happy that robots might steal all our jobs? Um, because work is a hassle. Um, yeah, but it, pay <laughs> <laughs> it pays your mortgage or your rent. Yeah. I don't think a robot's um, going to give me my mortgage payments. Until the robots print houses with 
3D prints, uh, so that'll be <laughs> incredibly cheap as well. But I think that, that it's a good point, because we always have those, those problems, destructions of mm -hmm. old industries and old jobs. Uh, but that's really also the thing that created all the wealth that we have. The fact that we don't do the same old jobs that we always did, we can do that in a better way. That's what all the technology, all the machines, all the trade that we have has, has accomplished, so that we don't all work in agriculture and barely uh, find the time to create enough food to survive. Uh, technology helped us doing that. Uh, lots of people, 70% lost their jobs because of that, but that also liberated purchasing power because we didn't have to pay so much for food and then we could afford to buy other things, uh, manufacturing goods and, and so on. Now that's being done more and more by machinery and that gives us more purchasing power so that we can spend more on, um, on education, on services, on travel, on health, on mental health, things like that. So I think it's an ongoing progress but of course there are problems when that happens. Um, and therefore we have to work hard at making sure that we have dynamic economies so that people can move to the new jobs that are always being created in open economies. But aren't we in a different place now that we're actually talking about ro robots on a, you know, on a scale that we yeah. haven't seen before? Of course, you know, the spinning jenny is invented, yeah. big machines are invented, of course people are replaced, combine harvesters yeah. are invented, but the scale of the speed right. of change but, you know, in a sense it, seems it, different it, this time, no? It, but people always said that. You know, mm -hmm. it was raining today yeah. and we well, were all ha having umbrellas. The, you know, uh -huh. the first guy who b brought an umbrella to London streets, he was mocked by everybody because it looked silly. Uh, this was like early 18th century. But he was also attacked by all the drivers of uh, horse-drawn carriages because they thought that this would take all their jobs mm -hmm. because people always took that carriage instead when it was raining. But obviously we thought of new things as long as the economy is dynamic. Is it on another scale now? Perhaps it is, but also our methods of dealing with this is of another scale. Because now we've always thought that we would have some education early on in life and then we wouldn't have anything like that. Now we have digital education, we have opportunities of making sure that education is something that we're doing throughout life so that we learn new skills as well. Okay. So I'm not that worried about the jobs going. I think innovation will find new, new jobs, and then also yeah. I think we will innovate in our lives and how we do it. I do think the pace of change has got something to do with the mental health crisis. I think you know, human interaction, communication, uh, the ways in which human beings befriend each other and relate to each other, I agree, in the long run, we'll work out how to cope with it. But there has never been a period in human history, particularly if you're under the age of 30, in which your social experiences have undergone such rapid change. Mm. And that is, I think that is destabilizing. And I just wanted to say two very brief things. I want to stand up for bureaucracy, because, yeah, I, like you, stand given up. a choice for, between innovation and bureaucracy, I think innovation is probably to be preferred. But the historical story is not just a race between them, it's the interrelationship between them. And you know, innovation has its downside as well as its upside. And it's a story about a relationship between states and innovators, and this great story of the last 200 years has been happening in societies that have also built these bureaucratic institutions, and these two things have gone together. And I would be alarmed about a world in which we ditch the bureaucracy because Silicon Valley says we don't need it, and we just go with innovation. And on the violence question, very briefly, if you just do the 19th century, the 20th, 21st, the 19th century was a story of astonishing levels of violence. I've just read Richard Evans's history of 19th century Europe, the century of peace, it's worth reading, it's just a horror show. <laughs> year after year, a pogrom here, a thousand yeah. people yeah. killed there, the Greek yeah. War of Independence, it's a complete, it's just a bloodbath from beginning to end. But it stops, like a thousand people die and then it runs out of steam because it's not in connected, the movement isn't there. You can, the 20th century is fewer people doing the violence, but when they do it, it explodes. So the 21st century does scare me for some of the reasons you said. The democratization of it, I still think there's, it's much less likely that anyone's going to want to do it. But if someone does it, I mean, this kind of violence, this, this really destructive violence, we'll I, think of I, these 50 years as a nice interlude between the bad stuff. I wouldn't rule out by any means the possibility that an individual terrorist act involving a nuclear weapon will happen. I think it's easily possible that it might. Uh, and I think it might be truly awful if it does, but I don't think it'll be civilization ending. But, yeah. but that's a kind of that's a fairly muted optimism. <laughs> <laughs>
True. <laughs> True. There just, are... There just... are... <laughs> Very, it's pretty I, I think, determined, isn't it? There'll be nuclear Armageddon, but only over there, love, so it's David. fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think we could talk about all of this for a long time, but let's go to our next <laughs> set of questions. Um, the gentleman there in the front first, please, and then the uh, gentleman there at the back on the left, and I'm making the ushers work really hard, um, back in the, in the left there. And then let's have the person in front of you, I think in the blue V-neck jumper, are you right? Yep, so you two who are close to each other. And can we start with the gentleman? Yeah. Don't worry about standing up if this is difficult. My name is Neville Conrad. Uh, Madam Chairman, um, the panel have been talking about predicting the future and how difficult it is. <clears throat> I have two predictions, which I think it might be fun to share with the panel. The first is Not that... at enormous length, please. Sorry? <laughs> Not at enormous length, please. <laughs> the first is that um, the UK will not leave the European Union. Mm -hmm. And the second is that Donald Trump will be the first live US president not to serve a full four-year term. Okay. Very good <laughs> questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and the two... <laughs> How surprising, that should get applause in this room. <laughs> the gentleman there in the navy v-neck and then behind Thanks for giving us hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Adrian McConnick. I, I just wanted to, to, to ask, uh, isn't, isn't the thing around pessimism is that very often it is just a sales pitch? You know, you're going to burn in hell or we're all going to die because of, of you know, whatever environmental problem it might be or we're all going to die because of this, that or other, so you have to... Vote by, remain or everything, the plague of locusts will arrive tomorrow, exactly. that kind of thing. So you, yeah. you have to buy my sales pitch or vote for me or, or whatever. Okay, great question. And at the back, just behind. Um, I wanted to ask the panel if they thought that um, financial markets were a good example of the ways that pessimism and optimism can be reconciled. Because, for example, if you like something, you buy it. And if you th take a negative view of, say, the S&P 500, you would short it. And by a combination of the two processes, you reach uh, price discovery, which uh, is a good thing. So but, but possibly the two could be reconciled. Okay. And briefly, if you just want to add it on the end. Yeah. Uh, Dominic Lawson, I just wanted to touch on this thing that, uh, and ask you, isn't it a question of our sense of comparative advantage? And this is why people in the West are pessimistic. So when Trump talks about make America great again, he's saying, but we were the top dog. Mm. And when... Max, you started with this great thing about the easing of poverty in the third world. For most people in the West, that's no sort of pleasure at all. In fact, if anything, it's disappointing. I mean, when, what I mean is that when I was a child and I didn't eat my food because it was disgusting, my parents said, think of the starving people in India. And this cheered me up and I then began to eat. But what do I tell my children? <laughs> well, Are you not meant to say that anymore? No, it's <laughs> Um, okay, let's quickly go to the first two questions and very, very brief answers from the panel, please. David, will the Britain definitely leave the EU and will Trump resign before his term's up? Uh, you want answers to those yeah. questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Come on. I, yeah, I think Britain will all... leave the European Union and I think that... Um, oh, Brexit means Brexit. I think Brexit. Someone, and, so I've got that I mean, in I'm, my notes I'm, somewhere. So I'm with Matt. I think, I think Brexit is part of the kind of... You know, rough and tumble of democratic life. I think mm -hmm. Trump is on a completely different order than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I, I, I wanted Remain, and when I woke up and Brexit happened, I was excited, because I thought, this is interesting, I study politics. When <laughs> Trump was elected, it felt to me like the day after 9-11. I think these are different things. And I, I, I hope he might not serve, but then if he doesn't, the president will be Mike Pence, and that's no fun either. So. <laughs> um, um, and I just want to say one brief thing. Yeah. The question about hell and so on. I mean, there is a tendency yeah. to, you know, as the lone pessimist here, that you know, it's sort of apocalyptic pessimism. I'm not an apocalyptic pessimist. This is not about we're all going to die, this and that. This is all about balances of risks and probability and so on. I mean, it's all about thinking about worst-case scenarios. And you know, most things are getting better. But I think that if the bad things happen, it won't be the end of everything. But I do think we've had a great 50 years. And I would be really amazed if the next 50 years go as well. Okay, we'll come back to you on the, on the other points, but just briefly, will the UK definitely leave the EU and might Trump disappear somehow before... 
the uh, next American election. I, I would bet that the UK will leave the EU, um, but I would happily bet that Trump won't last four years. There are all sorts of ways in which he won't last. I mean, he might, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, someone might assassinate him, he might die, he might be impeached, um, he might get bored, go yeah. back to Trump Tower. <laughs> you know, there's, there's all sorts of possibilities. <laughs> so I, I would agree with you yeah, on one might. of those. Mm -hmm. um, just on, on, can I quickly on some of, of the other ones? Of course, but then yes. we, we will come back to them. Oh, we will. Let's, right, okay. yeah, let's do these ones first and then we'll come back to this one. Uh, I think Britain will leave. I'm not sure Trump will even be inaugurated. Um, <laughs> I, it's, yeah, has anyone been checking guess. the news while we've been talking? Who knows what's <laughs> yeah, happened exactly. in the last hour? <laughs> but just to combine right. this with another question, um, markets and, and oh, yeah. betting markets are pretty good at uh, not finding everything, but sort of touching on the wisdom of, of crowds, which is at least better than just finding a few people. I bet heavily that Donald Trump would become president of the US. Actually, financially, yeah. It's a How hedge. How much money did you make? I was going to ask that. It's, uh, I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> but, uh, Come on, tell uh, us now, but, but, right? That's but, 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 <laughs> it, I, I might need it to buy sort of canned foods and handguns. Or if a robot <laughs> takes your job, you'll yeah. need it to pay your mortgage. Um, just on that financial markets point then, do you think financial markets are a good place to reconcile, you know, that's where the reality is, right? This is the, the reconciliation of you three is the footsie. Well, I don't want to repeat what I said before, but I think it's a bit like the, the, the innovation point. I think we know how mm -hmm. it works when it works, but politics trumps financial markets in the end. And um, if we rely on financial markets to do the reconciling, politics will bite us. That's what's happened. Matt? Um, I think there's a big difference between two kinds of market. Markets and goods and services work incredibly well at reconciling, as it were, pessimists and optimists, supply and demand. Markets in assets for resale have this habit of bubbling and crashing, and we haven't been able to stop it. It started in 1720, or earlier, if you like, go back to tulips, and we don't seem to be able to stop it. So hyper, uh, you know, the, the, what's the word? Irrational, irrational exuberance is... Uh, is, is, a, is a problem in, in asset markets, but not in goods and services markets. And I think that's an incredibly interesting point that we need to try and understand. Um, just on uh, Dominic Lawson's point mm -hmm. about uh, financial, uh, about, in, uh, about Comparative how on earth is he going to get his grandchildren to, to, to eat their greens if he can't talk about Biafra? Um, uh, and, <laughs> and, and I think he's, he's touched on an interesting point which we keep forgetting about, which is that most people, I bet most people in this room think inequality is getting worse in the world. And it isn't. It's getting better rapidly because people in poor countries are getting rich faster than people in rich countries. Yep. It's got to be true. Uh, it's actually getting better in this country. There was data uh, mm -hmm. the other day week, as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that is good news, but of course you can turn it into a, a, a problem if you, if you wish, Dominic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It, it, but it's a motivator. If you treat it's the world as a whole, about human motivation. Is the best it's ever been, which means it currently is at the same level as South Africa, the most unequal society on earth. So it is moving in the right direction, but... But it's still, the, there's still a lot of inequality. Yeah, yes, unequal. yes, I'm not saying that it's not... And the, then let's the treat the world as though it were a single entity. I mean, one of my problems with this story, I completely agree with Dominic, is that you know, it's comparative, it's relative. Some people are going up very rapidly, some people are going up slowly, some people are going down. Um, and politics divides up according to some of those kinds of groupings. I think the other big difference between these different societies, and we haven't touched on this at all, we live in very elderly societies. I mean, we're mm. really old. Most of these rapidly accelerating societies yeah. are still very young. And to live in an elderly society is a great luxury. But, you know, some of these societies, places like Italy, people aren't really having kids yeah. at all anymore. Yeah. And again, there's no historical precedent for that. It might be fine. But we don't know. We don't know what happens you know, when the median age gets above 50. Can I just quickly touch on the, the, the other question about... But pessimism uh, being a sales pitch. Yes, pessimism as a sales pitch. Um, sure, if you put out a leaflet saying, please send us money, fracking will give you cancer, you'll get more money than if you put out a leaflet saying, fracking's fine, please send us money. In other words, yes, I'm afraid pessimism is, is an effective sales pitch often. Do you think that's true? I think every teenage boy knows that being worried is a sales pitch compared to being sort of generally enthusiastic. Why? You seem interested. Having never been one and myself. But, um. <laughs> you know, Lord Byron wrote about this that, look, it's, uh, you think it's all good and nice to be a genius, but it's actually awful because I can see all the horrors of the world, so I can't, uh, I can't do the dishes today, basically. I can't uh, pay 
a lot of attention to my girlfriend. He actually okay, wrote so this in a letter. So the tortured soul is trying to get The tortured soul okay. is interesting, and it's also a cheap way. I think John Stuart Mill pointed this out at one point. It's a cheap way of showing that you care about the world, because you don't have to do anything to improve the world. You can just say, oh, how can you be happy? How can you be smiling when kids are suffering? Over there. Yes, well, the, what are you doing about uh, helping? No, nothing, the John but I'm Stuart Mill worried. quote is, it is not the man who hopes when others despair, but the man who despairs when others hope, who is regarded as a sage. <laughs> <laughs> Easier to be a critical genius than a genius with a genuinely yes. good new idea. Okay, um, we are starting to get towards counting down to the bottom of the clock, so let's try and get in a couple more sets of questions. <laughs> so, what about uh, the top floor? Ah, yes, excellent. We have somebody, we have somebody bravely standing at the microphone. What a shy bunch up there, my goodness. I can't believe that an Intelligence Sorry, Squared audience would not provide waiting. somebody at the top of the microphone, maybe, maybe in a second or two. Let's go right to the back. A uh, lady there with the blonde hair, and then another lady right there in the middle, and let's go here to the front row, and we'll try and get another round in before it's time to go and have another round of a different sort. So, lady there at the back first. Hi, I wanted to address the fact that you say um, young people are normally more positive and optimistic and actually um, make a point about my son, who is 12 years old, who just when Trump got elected said to me, Mommy, you were so lucky you had Obama and we're going to have Trump. And this is at 12 years old. Um, I think it doesn't take much to see, especially I come from Italy, to see that we had an example in history that was Berlusconi. We know what happened to Italy. We know the damage it done to the country. And also, I think my son has been studying Germany. You know, Hitler and also Mussolini, they were elected democratically. Did, you know, the, the fact that people point out we need to be optimistic, we need to respect democracy, doesn't so, necessarily... So your, so your question is the next generations may well have it much harder than... Okay, the next question was... And, uh, sorry, I just yeah. may want to make a point about how, the, okay, how actually... Briefly, if you young, can, very briefly, still trying to get lots you know, of Young in. people do get affected by things like Brexit. He is only 12 years old. He knows that his mum might actually be deported because I'm a housewife, I've been here for 15 years, and grants me absolutely no right to stay in the country. Okay. So he is worried, and there is a lot of reason why young people are pessimistic. Okay. And question down there, please. Yeah, Laura, this is kind of a question for you as well. We talked about the media. Do you think that now in the days that we have instant access to news, it is feeding more negativity and pessimism? Okay, thank you. And it was the gentleman here. It's just right here. It's right here. Um, does the science, not the superstition of climate, climate change, uh, affect your view of the future, pessimist or optimist? So does the science of climate change affect your view? Okay. David, let's go to you first. I'm not, I'll leave climate, should we leave? Um, maybe Climate's come back. I mean, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I have a lot of sympathy with um, the idea that if you're 5 or 10 or 15 now, um, that there are reasons to be unnerved, I think, rather than think that it's all going to be terrible, but to be, to be unnerved. Um, I mean, there, there have been lucky generations and there have been unlucky generations, even in this broadly upward trajectory. I think a... You know, would you an unlucky generation or two, probably? Um, and and this, the, the, the people who are youngish now, maybe one of them, um, will get through the, the, the destruction of jobs and will come out the other side okay. But it's, it, it all depends on what time scales you take for these things. And, and lots of people, their lives are blighted by the bit that goes wrong at the wrong time for them. And I think if you are young now, you might have reason to think your 20s and 30s are going to be pretty tough. Although I remember growing up watching When the Wind Blows, right? We were all terrified of having to put a mattress up against the door. I mean, it's not, an, is it, a, do you think it's substantively different now? I think there's a difference between a truly apocalyptic thing that hovers in the background of your consciousness and a sense of unnerved uncertainty about some of the basics of human experience. And yeah, I, like you, grew, grew, I mean, so the, the 80s, the 90s, that was my period. We had that great transition from 89 through to 91. But this seems to me to be different. And I do, I do think that if you, if you grow up with this technology, thinking about what the world's going to be like in 20 years' time, 30 years' time, is really hard. And does that instant access to information, instant access to news, does that make a difference? Does that add to the churn and that anxious feel, do you think? I mean, no, no question human beings are, are going to be capable of adapting to all of this. But the adaptation is, is going to be difficult, and, and some people are going to really struggle with it. And some people will be the losers in this, 
And there may be lots of them. Yeah. Access to information, yes, mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, there are so many wonderful things about it. Um, but one problematic thing is that we then have access to all the problems of the world in a new way that we didn't before. In a way, that's good because then we probably will do things to, to deal with those problems, but it also makes us more worried than we were before, I think. And global media, as I pointed out before, mm -hmm. I think that gives journalists an opportunity to find everything, but so does social media. Human suffering is not new, but cell phone cameras are new. So there's always someone there when something goes wrong, anywhere in the world, and that will then be top of mind, and we'll, see, we'll wake up to that story in our feeds. And I think that social media might, it will be interesting to see studies of this in the future. I think that does something to us as well when everything is sort of mixed up. When you turn on the news, you kind of expect awful things from ev around the world. But when you go to Facebook, you expect to see sort of someone's kids celebrating Christmas and some nice cats, and then suddenly Aleppo and war mm -hmm. and suffering. And then you continue with some nice story about uh, sort of your relatives do this and that, and then there's another awful human tragedy. That, I think, gives us the sense that it's everywhere. We can't get away from it. And since it's cell phone cameras and it's in real time, it kind of triggers our fear in a way that a reflective news story about this wouldn't do. So I think there's some problem there, too. We have to learn to deal with or it, perhaps handle it, understand it. Perhaps, Matt, actually, though, the, the, the shock of those things actually are diminished, right? When information, including scary that information, is around us all the time. I mean, what do you make of that? Well, I think it's important to recognize that being an optimist doesn't mean thinking the world is fine. Quite the reverse. I think the world is a veil of tears compared with what it's going to be and what we could make it. Uh, and in that sense, this is exactly the opposite of what the word originally meant. When Voltaire coined the word for Dr. Pangloss, Dr. Pangloss went around saying the world is perfect because God made it and therefore it couldn't be better. So if 70,000 people die in an earthquake in Lisbon, um, that must be because they were sinners, so that it's made the world better. Uh, and, uh, you know, th that... Th it's so, a view. So, so do Dr. Pangloss thought any change would make it worse. Dr. Pangloss would join Greenpeace today because he would think any innovation is a bad thing. So actually, you know, it's Panglossian to be a pessimist. Sorry, I've kind of gone off track, but it was, it was interesting. <laughs> you know, th this isn't... Our philosophy is not that the world is perfect. There are horrible things wrong with it, and one's right to be concerned about them because we should solve them. Very briefly on climate change. Uh, yeah, well, uh, talking about Greenpeace brings us to that naturally, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there are people like John Kerry who say this is the greatest threat facing mankind. I think it's an issue. I think it's real. I think the science is real. Uh, I don't personally think it's as nearly as big a threat as that. Uh, and I do agree with Donald Trump that some of the uh, measures we're taking to combat it are doing more harm than good, uh, more harm than they ever could do good. Briefly, David? It's, it's not the thing I'm most worried about. I don't think I quite agree with Matt. I think I'm probably more worried than, than Matt is, but it's not the thing I'm most worried about. Um, I mean, there, again, there are risks of suddenly a step change in what happens, and mm -hmm. beings can adapt, but if they have to adapt really, really fast, it can go badly, badly wrong. And what would go wrong is the politics. Um, and so we do need to think about possible scenarios, but it's not the th that's never been the thing that keeps me awake at night. Okay, I think we've got time to squeeze in one more set of questions, so stick your hand up, it's your last chance. Okay, young gentleman there in the blue, and then the gentleman there in the pale blue shirt, and then let's have still no one from upstairs, what a shy bunch. And then the gentleman there, in fact, let's start with you. Sorry, and if you can keep these brief, please, because we're really on the clock now. It's starting to sound like optimism is for the right wing and pessimism is for the left wing. True or false? Great question. Okay, uh, where is my next up there gone? Um, I recently saw the uh, latest Michael Moore documentary film, uh, Where to Invade Next, which said that in the financial crash in Iceland, three of the four national banks in Iceland were run by men. They all crashed and the executives were jailed. The one bank that thrived and was unaffected by the crash was run by women who didn't understand subprime mortgages and they thought if we don't understand it, we're not going to recommend it to our clients. Or the other way of looking at it is the Harriet Harman view of the world, that women yeah. wouldn't have taken such silly risks in the first place. If, exactly. No so comment. my question is, 
if in, in the forthcoming 50 years or so, women become more in charge, would that make you more optimistic? Okay, great. Uh, and I had one more final question, young chap there, yeah. Yeah, this is a question for the optimists. Um, a paper by David Woodward, uh, published in 2015, mapped out the global economic trajectories of the global poor, and it found that it will take 200 years for the disappearance of the last person living on less than $5 a day, um, and the increase in consumption by 2,000-fold of the average human being, and the global, global GDP by 175 times. Um, so forgetting just the climate change and sustainability for a moment, that's 200 years from now, and people still can't even afford a Subway sandwich. Um, and to think about how long it would take for people to live in lifestyles like these. I mean, it's centuries, centuries, centuries away. And my question is, is, sorry, um, is this rate of progress even adequate or even tolerable? And so I want to take it from the binary question of yes or no optimism so to... Is progress too slow, in fact, rather than the rapid rate of progress these guys have been talking about? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. lovely. Thank you so much. Excellent questions, all three. Uh, and we need to do these really briefly. So I'm going to go left to right on all three, if we can. Okay. So this Sorry. is like a quick fire round. Okay, it's probably not very intelligent squared. I don't know if we're allowed to do this. It's not a kind of proper discursive way, but let's try. So if in the next 50 years, women become in charge of more and more things that make the world a better place, would you be less pessimistic? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Is the rate of progress actually too slow? No. <laughs> and then I want to answer the left wing. And is optimism as, as the person as on the left is, of this is, panel? Is optimism right well, it, wing and so pessimism left wing? So that's a really excellent wing. question. It's ironic yeah, it's because question. it's a total turnaround from what you know, it used to be. The left were the optimists, and the, the right thought that human beings were fallen creatures and needed to be um, kept in check. And it's partly, I think, because the left, on the whole, had a pretty bad 20th century. I mean, the, the really sort of many of the terrible things that were done were done in the name of the left. Um, I mean, I think these things go in cycles. But the one thing I will say is that whether it's the left who are being over, whether, sorry, whether it's the left being the optimist or the right being optimists, people overshoot. The left overshot their optimism. I think the right is overshooting its optimism. Okay, Johan, if more women were if in charge, if if, if, yeah. um, if in the next 50 years women are in charge of more, does that make you more optimistic or less? Well, generally, I'm in favor of more people generally getting access to all the levers of uh, sort of power and business Come and so on. Come on, we're doing so, a gender so question. Yes, yes. But, <laughs> but it could be Martians as well. I mean, it could be <laughs> people who run... No, no, but seriously, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a strong Fair opinion on whether... <laughs> <laughs> um, and, generally, okay. people... And, and as an optimist, is progress actually too slow? Well, actually, when it comes to poverty, extreme poverty has been reduced in 25 years from 37% around the world to less than 10%, almost by three quarters. It's the fastest ever. Is it enough? No, it's too slow. And optimism right-wing, pessimism left-wing? <sighs> I mean, isn't Donald Trump pretty right-wing? And he doesn't seem like an optimistic guy. He seems to think that everything's... He's, he's so, not, it's not morning in America again. It's mm -hmm. America is a hellhole. That's what he said. So, like campaign. David, you think so, those labels are right? I think, yeah, I think it's a complete realignment. Mm -hmm. And I would, I think, I, I'm stealing this from Matt Ridley's book, The Rational Optimist, actually, that in there, there's a green and a blue and a red pessimism and optimism in a way as well. Isn't that it? So, basically, everybody wants to are, are reactionary. And they could be green for environmental reasons, mm -hmm. right wing for cultural reasons, leftists for economic reasons. So They're everywhere. Too, but also there are optimists yeah. in all those categories as well. Okay, and Matt, first question, if in 50 years women are basically running everything, is that a good thing? Oh, everything. Yes, clearly, based on their track record, particularly in this country, women are fantastic at running <laughs> things. Um, and at the, um, at the moment, we've got a woman head of state, a woman head of government, women heads of all the devolved administrations. It's going great. Um, second question. Uh, progress. <laughs> I thought you were. Um, is progress too slow? Uh, isn't it wonderful that we can start to ask questions like that? Isn't that that great? That shows, you know, progress is as, as Johan says, faster than ever before, and we're not satisfied. Great. And finally, optimism, right wing, pessimism, left wing. Op uh, optimism is, uh, uh, sorry, right-wing people are socially pessimistic and economically optimistic, left-wing people vice versa. Nicely done. Our final task of the evening is for you. So, I'm going to ask who's now optimistic and who's pe now pessimistic, 
And who, if anybody, has changed how they felt 90 minutes ago? So, optimists, raise your hand. Ooh, I think that's gone up. Yeah. Pessimists? That, that's also gone up. That's also gone up. <laughs> OK. So the, the I think the abstainers yes, the have all have decided. Wow. Out. I think that was still sort of 50-50, though, or maybe... No, 48, I, I 52. I was outnumbered on the panel, but I do think you won. Well done, <laughs> Very gracious. Um, can I say thank you to all of you for your questions and for your honest voting, what I hope was honest voting. I shall say once more that all three of these excellent contributors' tomes will be available in the foyer for signing, and no doubt for some conversation if they're up for some more chats. Um, but please give them a big hand, round of applause. Thank you all very much indeed.